about the wines, the, the legendary wines of Tokai. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with some of the wines, some of the styles, probably the Noble Rot Azu. Has anyone here been to Tokai? Nobody at all. Uh, it is arguably the first ever wine producing region to be classified. It was first classified in the year 1700 into first growths, second growths, great first growths and so on. Tokai for many years, for hundreds of years, was a must stop in the, the richest, most powerful potentates in Europe. It was uh, drunk by Louis XIV, it was drunk by Queen Victoria, Peter the Great, uh, various popes, uh, Catherine the Great even posted a garrison of troops at her favourite vineyard in Tokai to protect the grapes, the sweet grapes as they were being picked and this garrison of troops that escorted them back to St Petersburg for her to drink. In the 1700s and 1800s Tokai was the most expensive wine in the world, much more expensive than Chateau de Tour, Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Yclem, Domaine de Rome, Le Conte may have existed, it was, certainly wasn't heard of internationally. Tokai was the most expensive, most sought after, most coveted wine in the world. If we fast forward through the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, through to the 1970s and 1980s, Tokai, as a fine wine, was almost extinct. It barely existed. So it was a really tragic, slow, steady decline over the years. But the history is mainly about, almost exclusively about, sweet wine. The dry wines were made only because they had to be made when there was no noble rot and they needed the dry wines to help make the sweet wines. However, uh, back in 2003, Royal Tokai started to make uh, a dry ferment, which is the first wine we're going to taste today. Wine uh, number one. So this is made from 100% ferment. Ferment is the um, predominant grape variety in Tokai. It is a, has a very long ripening season. It's an early budder and a late ripener. So it has a very, very long season. To me, this gives um, uh, a slightly apple-y um, aroma on the nose, very fresh, very clean. Uh, some stone fruit, perhaps a little bit of peach, a little bit of apricot. And on the palate, it's quite rich, isn't it? Quite rich and full. Ripe fruit, and finishing off very clean and very fresh. Any any comments on this wine? Anyone like or dislike strongly? It has. Uh, uh, it was fermented in, um, in oak and aged in oak for six months. The oak we use is Hungarian from the Zemplin Mountains. The Zemplin Mountains are up here to the north of the region. So we use as much as we can, everything is local to the region. We do not use French barrels, lovely as they are, but we use our equally lovely local oak it's a cool climate up there, so very tight grade. Uh, we vinify each parcel separately, and then the winemaker will blend to produce the final cuvee. It has 5 grams per litre of acidity and 14% alcohol. It's a really strange variety of ferment when it comes to making dry wine. We simply don't, we're going to be making it, as I say, I think 2012 will be our 10th vintage. Um, but it's very, very hard to predict what's going to happen to it when it ages. You'd think with all those components it would age 
fantastically well and gone for 10, 20 years. Some do, some don't. And we're still, the winemaker is still experimenting. We're still working on it. Um, but this style, uh, I think, appeals to people who are perhaps getting a little bit bored with Sauvignon, a little bit bored with Chardonnay, moving on to Albarinos, to uh, Grunewald Lina. This sort of wine, very mineral, very crisp acidity, very good with food, slightly unusual taste profile, finding it very, very successful indeed. It needs uh, the sommelier or whoever to get behind it, but one, once they do and it's tasted, we find it very, very popular uh, indeed. Like this like. Good. So wine number two is uh, Late Harvest. Now this is a wine that, uh, with, has anybody heard of Zamorodny? The traditional, Zamorodny is the traditional tokais that were oxidatively made. Yeah. The grapes are picked late, it's exactly what it says on the bottle, a late harvest. So the grapes are overripe, picked much later than, than for the dry wine. So they're high in sugar. It may or may not be botrytis. It's a big botrytis year, as 2008 was. They'll go through the vineyards and pick by the bunch. If there's botrytis there, then it goes so much the better. In other years, uh, 2010, when there was no botrytis, it would just be overripe grapes. This year, 2009, there was some botrytis, some overripe. So it's, it's a mixture. So it's, it's picked by the, by the bunch and then um, produced very reductively. Uh, there's a proportion of muscat in this wine, just about 10-15% to give it some lift, to give it some that lovely gorgeous grapey aroma. Uh, and it's blended with ferment, which we've already tried, and the third, or probably the second most important grape in the, the region, Harsh Levelu, which is another variety local to the region, very high in acidity. You always get strong acidity in Tokai. Always, always, always. I've never found a wine that has it. They can be bad wines, but they're always crisp. And the sweet wines, these days, they're always low alcohol. This wine is 10%. Just 10% alcohol. So a very, very modern wine. Retails for about 11 quid for a half litre bottle. So a very, very modern style. It's young, it's fresh, it's fruity, it's clean, low alcohol, gorgeous with a bowl of strawberries on a warm afternoon like today. Uh, very good as an aperitif, that uh, crispness gets the juices going. Great with Asian food, really fantastic with, with um, Thai food, I find. Uh, or more traditionally with, with a sweet, uh, with a pudding, or with cheese. Fermented in stainless steel, and aged for seven months in new oak, but to be honest, I get very little new oak on the nose. I think I just get pure, gorgeous, lovely fruit. While we're looking at, um, while we're looking at this wine, I'll tell you a little bit about the region. Tokai is on the same latitude as Champagne, or somewhere between Champagne and Chablis. It's, uh, the base soil is volcanic. It's an old volcano, and that is the subsoil. It's very high in iron. The soil is very high in iron and in lime. And the topsoil varies. In some vineyards, it's a clay topsoil which tends to give richer, fuller, more powerful wines. And in other vineyards, it's Lois, that very fine, powdery, dry, sandy topsoil. And that tends to give a lighter, more elegant, more honeyed style. We own vineyards in many, many regions, different communes with different soils. So for these wines, it's a question of blending and getting the, the style of wine that we want. Late harvest is very consistent year to year. It's made every year and is a very consistent product. 
unlike the wines we're going to taste in a minute, which vary a lot and are not always made, very vintage specific. To the north of the region, I've already said, the Zemplin Mountains, and then beyond them are the Carpathian Mountains, so serious mountains. So you get some cold air coming down from there. To the south is the Great Hungarian Plain, which is, if you've been there, you will know it is incredibly flat. It makes Lincolnshire look like the Himalayas. It is flat, flat, flat. It just goes on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. And my geography is going to let me down now until it reaches, I think, Serbia, Croatia, somewhere down there. So you get a lot of warm air building up to the south and a lot of cold air coming down from the mountains in the north. There are also two rivers. The, the, the Bodrog, you can see here, is the big river coming down which goes down into the town of Tokai. You'll see another river going off to the east. These two rivers meet in the town of Tokai, which is why the region is called Tokai, because that's where the rivers met. So Tokai was the market town. They all came in the, down the river hundreds of years ago to Tokai. In actual fact, the village of Tokai is not the, probably the best place for grapes. It's probably Mad, which is where we're based. Uh, but that's why the region is called Tokai. So at, at Tokai, these two rivers meet. The Bodrog is bigger and slightly colder than the, than the, than the Teaser. So you get some cold air, some cold water meeting some slightly warmer water. Same time you've got cold air and warm air meeting in more or less the same place. So, if we're lucky, and it happens we hope six or seven years out of ten, if we're lucky, in October, November, every morning, you'd wake up in the morning, you're staying in your hotel, draw back the curtains, you can't see a thing, there's thick fog. End of October, beginning of November, day after day. You can hardly see from here to there. That's from early morning until about 11 o'clock in the morning. Suddenly the mist will clear and the sunshine will beat down, beautiful, warm, sunny weather. These are the perfect conditions for botrytis. You'll see in your pamphlet, the other, there's a picture of botrytis grapes. Are you all familiar with botrytis? Noble rot. Noble rot is a, a fungus and reduces them to this rather these raisiny, shriveled dried grapes, they, so they dry up, but what's happening in there is that it's actually a very good fungus, we love it, it's noble, it uh, shrivels the grapes, the water in the grape is reduced, it evaporates, meanwhile all the lovely things we like in the grapes, the acidity, the minerals, the trace elements, um, concentrate and new flavors are produced. So we have, and we have very, very intense sugars. So these are shriveled grapes, a little bit like raisins you might buy in the supermarket, but much more flavorsome, much more concentrated and natural. They're not dry, they're not laid out on mats to dry. It happens naturally. This will happen four, five, six years out of every 10. These grapes, don't have to be picked one by one. Because very rarely, now these are probably not on a, a vine, but they normally happen very irregularly. They literally have to be picked one by one. So a whole team of us, probably this many people, would go through a vineyard and just pick tiny little amounts. So it's a very, very expensive business. Tiny, tiny yields, really low volumes. So these grapes, what the, uh, the French would call uh, Purature Nobler, uh, and what the Hungarians called Azul, the Germany and Austria Ausbruch. And it's these grapes 
but go into making the third one we're going to taste. Royal Tokai, Blue Label, 5 Kutonyos, 2007. So this is the real, the real traditional, the real thing. The legendary wine of Toka. So this is a very sweet wine. Much sweeter than, than Sauternes, but much higher in acidity. So it won't taste as sweet. It has that incredibly fresh acidity at the finish that balances the richness, the sweetness. It's 164 grams per liter of sugar. That's pretty sweet. On the nose, I get um, a lot of tangerine and orange peel, maybe some marmalade. of honey maybe. A lot of depth and a lot of complexity. Very low alcohol again, just 11.5% alcohol. We're really crisp, yeah? Get that really refreshing, zingy finish. It really makes me want to eat something. It's like an aperitif, it's almost like a, a Fino Sherry or something. It's mouthwatering acidity. Really nice. Very nice. It's such a lovely way to finish a meal. I was thinking at the end of the meal, you probably had a Maybe a glass of champagne to start with, a glass of white, a glass of red. Why not finish this a meal with something really light and refreshing, lowish alcohol, just something that lifts and enlivens you. Um, it goes fantastically well with all puddings, with cheese, um, tart tatin, uh, hard cheeses, um, just about anything, really. The acidity is so strong and so refreshing. Um, five the explanation for all these Kuton you can get three, four, five, and six Kuton is uh, traditionally when they went through the vineyards picking grape by grape, you had on your shoulder a hod or a basket. So as you picked, you put the grapes in there. And in, in Hungarian, this is called a putonyos. So once you've uh, filled one basket, it took about 20 kilograms of grapes, so it took you a long time. You went to the end of the row and tipped this putonyos into a barrel. The barrel was called a gontsi. So the number of these uh, baskets or put on yosh that went into the barrel, the more that went in of these concentrated sweet grapes, the sweeter the wine. Now they don't do it that way anymore, it's all a bit more technical now, it's all in grams per litre of sugar. Uh, this is a five put on yosh wine, so the minimum it must be is 120 grams per litre of sugar. Correction, 150. There is no maximum. It can be higher than 150. Then 150 to 180 is six percent yosh. This wine is actually 164 grams per liter, so it could be legally a six percent yosh wine. But we call it a five because our standards are very, very high, and it's, it's the Royal Tokai style is to be that little bit richer than others. So for a five percent yosh, 120 is the minimum. So it's a very sweet wine, but as I say, the, uh, the acidity just balances it out and keeps it all clean and refreshing and traps in all those beautiful flavours. What do we think of that? Is that a... So we, we produce, of this wine, just uh, 20,000 
three litre cases. They come in half litre bottles. This is a traditional Tokai bottle. So 20,000, six bottle cases like this.